the origins go back 30 years to a plan by the United States to surround Russia by NATO countries, especially in the Black Sea region. Already, Big Brzezinski spelled this out in an article in Foreign Affairs magazine in 1997 and in his book, The Global Chessboard, spelling out why Ukraine was so central to the American strategy to uh, reduce or end Russia as a great power. The idea was that if NATO would expand to all of the countries of the Black Sea surrounding Russia, that means to Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, already a member, and Georgia, after Russia would no longer be able to project power in the eastern Mediterranean or the Middle East. So this was uh, the goal. And in 2004, NATO expanded to Romania and Bulgaria, and in 2008, at the Bucharest NATO summit. Bush pushed against European opposition for NATO to declare that it would enlarge to include Ukraine and Georgia. Russia, that is, Russian leaders across the board said repeatedly, this is a red line, do not cross it. We have a 2,300 kilometer border with Ukraine. NATO must not attempt to enter Ukraine. That would be a direct threat to our national security. There was an even broader context to it, Steve, which is that the United States was placing missiles around Europe after having unilaterally abandoned the anti-ballistic missile treaty in 2002. The United States had bombed for 78 straight days Russia's alley Belgrade, and that was actually a NATO bombing for 78 days to break Serbia apart, which it did, and then the U.S. unilaterally recognized Kosovo, after that NATO bombing, the U.S. had unilaterally gone to war with the Iraq in 2003 over the strong objections of the U.N. Security Council. The U.S. had covertly, but quite evidently, tried to overthrow Bashar al-Assad in Syria starting in 2011. The U.S. and NATO quite explicitly bombed Libya to overthrow Russian Ali Muammar Gaddafi and the United States that conspired to violently overthrow Ukraine's President Viktor Yanukovych in February 2014. Incidentally, these are all basic points e easily known and where the U.S. mainstream media has gone out of its way to create a kind of amnesia in the United States. The worst of all of this is the New York Times. I'm sorry to say, won't tell its readers any of the truth. Um, any of the background of this, what's interesting is that the NATO Secretary General, Jen Stoltenberg, actually spelled it out, I think. The origins go back 30 years to a plan by the United States to surround Russia by NATO countries, especially in the Black Sea region. Already Big Brzezinski spelled this out in an article in Foreign Affairs magazine in 1997, and in his book, The Global Chessboard, spelling out why Ukraine was so central to the American strategy to reduce or and Russia as a great power. The idea was that if NATO would expand to all of the countries of the Black Sea surrounding Russia, uh, that means to Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, already a member, and Georgia that Russia would no longer be able to project power in the eastern Mediterranean or the Middle East. So this was the goal. And in 2004, NATO expanded to Romania and Bulgaria. And in 2008, at the Bucharest NATO summit, Bush pushed against European opposition for NATO to declare that it would enlarge to include Ukraine and Georgia. Russia, that is Russian leaders across the Board said repeatedly, this is a red line. Do not cross it. We have a 2,300 kilometer border with Ukraine. NATO must not attempt to enter Ukraine. That would be a direct threat to our national security. There was an even broader context to it, Steve, which is that the United States was placing missiles around Europe after having unilaterally abandoned the anti-ballistic missile treaty in 2002, the United States had bombed for 78 straight days Russia's alley Belgrade, 
And that was actually a NATO bombing for 78 days to break Serbia apart, which it did. And then the U.S. unilaterally recognized Kosovo after that NATO bombing. The U.S. had unilaterally gone to war with the Iraq in 2003 over the strong objections of the U.N. Security Council. The U.S. had covertly, but quite evidently, tried to overthrow Bashar al-Assad in Syria starting in 2011. The U.S. and NATO quite explicitly bombed Libya to overthrow Russian Ali Muammar Gaddafi and the United States that conspired to violently overthrow Ukraine's President Viktor Yanukovych in February 2014. Incidentally, these are all basic points easily known and where the U.S. mainstream media has gone out of its way to create a kind of amnesia in the United States. The worst of all of this is the New York Times. I'm sorry to say, won't tell its readers any of the truth, any of the background of this. What's interesting is that the NATO Secretary General, Jen Stoltenberg, actually spelled it out, I think, kind of inadvertently bragging to Europeans. What I'm gathering from both your standpoint and your unexpected ally in this matter is that there was significant awareness regarding the cause and effect relationship of initiating and then cementing the path for Ukraine to join NATO. This was anticipated to lead to a conflict with Russia, and as you mentioned earlier, it was suggested that this might have been the intention from the outset, according to Zbigniew Brzezinski, former National Security Advisor to President Carter. It was the plan and the fact that this would lead to war was understood by American uh, diplomats. Uh, it was warned by the U.S. Ambassador to Russia in 2008, none other than William Burns, currently our CIA director, who sent a famous memo from Moscow to Condoleezza Rice entitled, Net Means, Net No Means No. And he was explaining it's not just Putin. It's across the entire Russian political class, the complete fervent opposition to America's expanding NATO to Ukraine. This is clearly understood. Then Victoria Newland, then the Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, now the Deputy Secretary of State, 2014. And it was in January, actually, weeks before the violent overthrow was caught on tape, presumably by the rush, planning the post Yanukovych government, who would replace the government. And she spelled out uh, exactly who would become the next prime minister. You know, this is a standard U.S. regime change operation. So here, yes. Well, allow me to inquire, Jeff, about when Bill Burns who was the U.S. ambassador to Russia at the time and is now the director of the CIA, penned that memo. I had the opportunity to review it. Memo and that memo spelled it out very quickly. It said this would be a neuralgic issue. Never. It's hard to forget that kind of language and neuralgic issue for the Russians. If you Ukraine were to join NATO and around that same time, Someone you and I both know, Richard Haas, was also working for that Bush administration as a director of policy planning and had written a white paper basically saying that if we didn't find a way somehow to get, if Russia were to become a member of NATO, it was foreseen that it would create a situation of us versus them. It was considered crucial that in order to diffuse the traditional tension between Europe and Russia, a way for Russia to be included needed to be identified. Hass has informed me that this aspect was overlooked. What exactly was happening within the administration during this time? Because it not everyone was on board with this so-called plan that you've laid out. Well, from the beginning, there were very strong voices of opposition to the NATO enlargement. It goes back, of course, to George Kennan himself in 1997, who was our senior statesman, historian, author of the containment policies, who said, to put it in clear terms, pursuing NATO enlargement, particularly without specifying Ukraine, was considered the most disastrous policy choice possible. At that time, it wasn't just about Ukraine. Even in the mid-1990s, Bill Clinton's Secretary of Defense, 
Bill Curry contemplated resigning in protest. This was because officials like Albright and Holbrook were advocating for NATO enlargement, which he viewed as a reckless move. Jack Matlock, the former US ambassador to the Soviet Union during the end of the Soviet era, emphatically stated that this was entirely the wrong course of action. How to do this will recreate the dangers of confrontation with Russia. So this wasn't a secret, but these are the neocons. Uh, this is Victoria Newland's the one constant in all of this. And she was Cheney's deputy security advisor. Then she was Bush's ambassador to NATO in 2008. Then she quickly became Hillary Clinton's spokesperson. Well, from the beginning, there were very strong voices of opposition to the NATO enlargement. It goes back, of course, to George Kennan himself in 1997, who was our senior statesman, historian, author of the containment policies, who said very explicitly, this is the worst imaginable policy to proceed with NATO enlargement. And at the time, he wasn't even talking about the Ukraine. He was talking about in general, in, in fact, uh, in the mid-1990s, Clinton's own Secretary of Defense bill. Curry thought about re-signing in protest because Albright and Holbrook were pushing NATO enlargement, and he thought it was reckless to do this. Jack Matlock, who was the U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union at the end of the Soviet Union, said this is absolutely the wrong thing. I to do this will recreate the dangers of confrontation with Russia so this wasn't a secret, but these are the neocons. Uh, this is Victoria Newland's the one constant in all of this. And she was Cheney's deputy security advisor. Then she was Bush's ambassador to NATO in 2008. Then she quickly became Hillary Clinton's spokesperson. Then she became the assistant secretary of state during the overthrow of Yanukovych. Now she is Biden. Deputy Secretary of State, she's been both parties, she's always there, this is the neocons, and they have fought their way through and they have created an absolute disaster, first and foremost for Ukraine. They trapped Ukraine so predictably, I wrote at the beginning of all of this in, two, in 2022, not the very, very beginning, but at the beginning of this special military operation, that this is yet another neocon debacle. And this is exactly as it's turned out to be. Well, given where we are now, we interviewed former Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel, who's normally in the realist camp on issues. And he said this has now become a defining issue for the United States and its and the impression of its power in the world that America cannot stand down. He criticized Joe Biden for the cautious pace at which Biden's team has proceeded, emphasizing that the issue is of utmost significance. Furthermore, he noted that as NATO has expanded, including the addition of several NATO members, it's possible to speculate that Russia could have become more eager for some of these other developments. Countries had NATO not expand. To them, and I think as Stoltenberg just said, Half of NATO is now many of these other NATO members that have joined since 1992. So what do you do with the argument that given where we are now, that this is now perceived to be a conflict that the United States cannot back out of? Well, um, that's what has said, been said about every disaster that the United States has been involved in from Vietnam and the domino theory onward. And... All of that is just a prelude to nuclear war. If they want to put it that way, we have to stop this stupid city of the United States that got us into this mess. Um, this is a war that the United States created, provoked by overthrowing Yanukovych by this NATO enlargement policy. And now we have to say, look, we stop. Russia's got to stop. We need to find peace before the world is destroyed in this process. So I don't buy it at all, what Hegel said. That's ridiculous. When you've made a terrible blunder like this, you don't stake everything on doubling down on the blunder. You solve the problem, and we can solve the problem by sorting this thing out properly in the way to 
sort this thing out properly is to end NATO enlargement as part of a peace arrangement in which the war stops, in which Ukraine is secure. But it's going to be in adjusted boundaries at this point. That is clear. NATO stopped enlarging. And on this question of the boundaries, let's remember that the United States backs boundary changes when it feels like it. So the United States felt like it when it bombed Serbia for 78 straight days to create Kosovo, which the United States unilaterally recognized in 2008 that border change was fine because the United States decided, in fact, it was NATO bombing of Serbia for 78 straight days. And the United States just thought it was just fine to change the borders of Sudan by backing the South Sudanese insurgency and then quickly declaring recognition of South Sudan. So the idea that borders are sacrosanct, that nothing can be changed, that's an American bluff. Also, we change the borders when we want, but no other borders can be changed. No, this is not how the world's going to work in reality. The United States had its chance to protect Ukraine in its 1991 borders. It had complete chance for that before February 2014. It should not have conspired to overthrow Ukraine's president because it was at that point that Russia retook Crimea because Russia did not want Sevastopol, its naval base, in 1783 falling to NATO hands, and the United States provoked that. Even then, Russia did not say, we take the Donbass, not at all. What Russia said is, the Don base should have autonomy as per the Minsk II agreements. Now, Minsk II was not only guaranteed by France and Germany in this so-called Normandy arrangement, it was backed 15 to nothing by the UN Security Council and who told Ukraine, now you don't have to follow through. That would be us, the United States. And so instead of compromising um, and having the Donbass gain some autonomy, the United States said, no, you remain a centralized Ukrainian state. We have your back and some back now. Russia is creating such losses of Ukraine on the battlefield that as we debate among ourselves, Russia is likely to have a major offensive operation, making so much of this moot even in the next few weeks. You know, one of the people I spoke to in the past, Jeff, was Andrei Kortun off in Moscow, the director general of the, I think the Russian Institute for International Affairs. And, and he said from his perspective that he saw this conflict as one of the ongoing historic aftershocks of really the fall of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War, the, the, the Soviet Empire. And he also saw America's behavior as being driven by a kind of memory of, he spoke about neo-imperial aspirations, suggesting that there were two declining empires that were struggling to navigate this situation. When asked about China's role in all of this, he essentially conveyed that China is likely relishing the spectacle of these two rival powers grappling with each other. How do you see China at this moment? What lessons is it drawing from this conflict, and is it benefiting from sitting back and watching Russia and the United States and their, and their supporters exhaust each other? Well, the United States policy has done one thing that's big. Brzezinski said um, was unthinkable that he, you know, he just thought it would be so ridiculous of American policy that he thought it really could never happen. And that's for the United States to drive Russia and China to gather as deep partners. That's precisely what the United States has done. And it's done it by going after Russia with the NATO enlargement and at the same time going after China, especially in economic warfare. And these a vis Taiwan, so China's not sitting back and enjoying this. China is feeling a tremendous pressure from the United States, which has basically stopped the put a, a wall on exports from China to the United States. Now China's exports are down 20 year over year 2022 and 2023. China has been cut off from technology by the United States, and the United States is now unilaterally arming Taiwan, 
not as in the past, by the way, with Taiwan buying us weapons, but by the president signing orders to give Taiwan weapons under a theory that we're going to make Taiwan so-called porcupine filled with weaponry that would deter not the Chinese attack. It will do precisely the opposite. It's the same dynamic that led Ukraine to disaster. So China's not sitting back and enjoying this. But China and Russia are seeing that the United States is put for its hegemonic status in an era that is where us hegemony is completely anachronistic. It was never very sensible as an idea. But in 2023, it's so out of date. But the neocons said, don't get the calendar right, that they just keep pushing. They declare openly that Russia and China are the enemy. It's driven the two of them together, and this makes this situation all the more dangerous. Well, let me ask you now a question about the American political scene in all of this, because we've just seen Ukraine funding stripped out A of a funding continuing resolution bill. I don't want to lose our viewers in the weeds on this, but nonetheless, Ukraine funding was a very hot item this week and discussed. And as we know, going towards the 2024 presidential election that Ukraine and American support for Ukraine, and I have to say, I've been amazed by how resilient Ukraine was. I was. You know. It's been. It's been quite fascinating to observe, but you can clearly see how it's evolving into a political issue that both sides are using as they grapple with it. Moreover, there seems to be a noticeable decline in Republican support for Ukraine. So as you sort of look at this and, and look at Joe Biden saying, we will be there as long as it takes, and you see others saying we can't get a bill through Congress right now with Ukraine funding, what is the scenario you see coming in? And this lead, does this lead to a sensible outcome or a tragic train? We're, we're at the end of the any large scale support from the United States for Ukraine. I think that that is smart, except that it should be combined with real negotiations between the U.S. and Russia and Ukraine on new security arrangements. So I, I think that this war should end through negotiations, not through this continued flood of money. The money is drying up because the American people are against it strongly in the Republican Party, but also the Democratic grassroots is not for this either. So the politicians in Washington and the White House expects to get its way. But no, you know, the, the voice of the people are is actually being heard right now, and it will be heard more and more as we enter the presidential election campaign. But in, it's, it's not only the United States all through Western Europe. The leaders are deeply unpopular um, because of the effects of this war. They don't buy it, and Slovakia just elected a government that campaigned precisely on stopping any more aid for Ukraine. Poland, which was the great backer of Ukraine, is not even on speaking terms. Government to government right now, Hungary has been long set against this. We're seeing that none of this makes sense, especially with Ukraine having been devastated on the battlefield this summer, the counter off. Sense of a complete tragedy, a massacre. Um, except if you happen to read the New York Times or the mainstream media. But if you really follow the facts on the ground, this has been horrible and all through Western Europe and the American. The, the scene, there was a call for something different, and there's something different should be negotiated peace. So what's the bottom line? There's just no doubt about it. Us aid to Ukraine has become a political football. The situation is still in flux. But as we approach Election Day, it's becoming increasingly complex. In my view, Washington has three available options. In Scott Towns, one, it could pull back, which will accelerate a very different world order with the U.S. perhaps less. Central or two, it could push for a negotiated end to the conflict in a way that doesn't result in a collapse of confidence in America stops the bloodshed and assures Ukraine its sovereignty in a sustainable arrangement, or three. 
Biden, and Ukraine supporters keep pumping money and arms into the war, hoping Russia's operation collapses before renegade. Republicans cut off those dollars, but right now we're closer to the scenario of slash funding and military fatigue than negotiations and deal-making. And that's the bottom line.